Welcome to How to Buy Your First Boat, Part 2. Part 1's already out there, and if you haven't watched it, you really need to watch or listen to it if you're on a podcast right now, because it is packed full of information. All the information that you need to know before you even consider going shopping. There's a lot of research and working out that you need to be thinking about before you get out and start looking. Yes, now we are talking mainly about a liverboard cruising sailboat, although this does apply to pretty much any kind of boat really. So you, if you're not looking for a sailing boat, perhaps just a motorboat or a weekend little motorboat, uh, there are going to be some little gems in here for you as well. Yeah, you might be going blue water cruising or you might be going coastal hopping, whatever it is, this applies to all of those events. But you've worked all that out because you've watched part one. Of course. A free tip, by the way. Here's a free tip. Be prepared to compromise. Compromise is the word of the day here. It, it is. It's all about compromise. You Com cannot find the perfect boat. There is no such thing as the perfect boat. But we're going to help you find the perfect-ish boat for you. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, there is an FTB blog post which covers all of part one and part two in detail. So if you want to see that blog post, you do need to become an FTB mate. It's on our website. It's available to all our friends and supporters on FTB mates. Link in the description below. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006 and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds. So, part two. Right. You so, ready to shop? Yes, ready to splash some cash, <laughs> eh? Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> So first off, let's talk about where you need to start looking. The obvious place, of course, is online. I can think of two resources in particular that are good. There's yachtworld.com and there's Apollo Duck. And these two websites are packed full of secondhand boats for sale. But Yacht World in particular is a really useful resource because you can break down every type of boat by length, by manufacturer, by year of manufacturer, uh, price, rigging, price, All e everything. Things. Where it is, location. Yeah. And it is a very good way of honing down your or shortlisting your list to, um, you know, say your top 10. It's a very good way of also seeing what else is out there as well, because you may already have in mind what what you're after. Well, if you've watched part one, you have. You've got a rough idea of what you want already so you can hone that search right down based on what you've already calculated there so that's a good place to start and my reckoning is that most people watching this have already been on Yacht World. Probably mm. yes Apollo Duck as well I think the advantage with Apollo Duck is quite often you're going direct to the buy you're not using a broker whereas in Yacht World there's a lot of broker uh, adverts on there but uh, yes. anyway they're two very good resources and if nothing else it's just nice to do a bit of window shopping. Yeah it is just take it with a pinch of salt because quite often that's the price that was put on not necessarily the price it was sold at so to get a really good idea of what a boat is worth we'll talk about that later but um, it gives you a rough idea. The next place you can look online of course are YouTube sailing channels ta-da that's us uh, plenty of them out there and of course they each have their own boat and you're probably already familiar with their boat that they're sailing. Quite often they'll do walkthroughs so you get to see the whole layout of the boat. Oh, it's really quite... interesting, yeah, it's yeah. very nosy, you can go down right down in th through the whole boat and look all over the deck, it gives you a really good idea of whether that's somewhere you think you could live or not. But of course if you're subscribed to those channels then you're actually going to become quite familiar with those these boats so you'll get to see uh, the trials and tribulations of the YouTube sailing channel uh, boat owners and to see how they cope when things go wrong, what goes wrong. Perhaps you might find some common themes going wrong on particular boats that you hadn't considered before. So definitely worth looking at those. But not just YouTube sailing channels. Um, publication houses like uh, Yachting Monthly or Practical Boat Owner, they do their own boat reviews normally of new boats but of course as we move forward in time these boats will become second-hand boats mm. so there's plenty of uh, video reviews out there done by 
professionals, let's call them. There's almost too much information out there, I think. <laughs> almost too much. You've got great choices. Actually, I should just say, I think it's Practical Boatowner also publish PDFs, which you can buy off their website. So you, just for a few quid, you can really? download a PDF of their review, which they did, you know, two years ago. Or even 10 years or 20 years ago. Mm. So for the older boats, they are fantastically useful. Hopefully they're still doing them, but they were good. We were looking at them at the time when we were buying. Um, Right, so that's the online, that's where you start. Next, start looking around in your area, however big you want to make the area is up to you, to see if there are brokers. So check for brokers in your area. They're usually associated with marinas and boatyards. And um, particularly if you've got a boatyard that's full, a nice big one with lots of boats for sale, find the broker, meet them. Don't just talk to them on the phone, get out there, meet them and make them your friend. Yes, because once you've made a friend with a broker, he won't leave you alone, which is a good thing because they'll be passing you information on new boats coming to the market. And sometimes they won't, the boat won't even get onto market. The broker will uh, catch wind of a boat that's about to be put on the market and you could be the first to know about it. So definitely worth befriending your local broker. Yes, if he knows what you're looking for and he's got exactly the right thing, he wants to sell it to you. And you do need to make sure, by the way, that you have explained to him that you're serious. You've given him the budget, you've told him what you're looking for, you're ready to buy, you've got the dosh burning in your hand. That is what's going to enthuse him. Enthuse him. He's not interested in time wasters. Yeah, I mean, These are professional salespeople, they know what's going on. There's a lot of tyre kickers out there mm -hmm. and the, the broker, you know, he can sniff these out a mile away. So uh, be, be serious and as you, as you said, Liz, just be clear in your mind what it is that you're after and he will take you much more seriously yeah. as well. But even if he has things to show you which you don't think quite ticks the boxes on your list, just go and see them anyway. Not with the idea of changing your mind, but you might pick up on a few ideas on, who knows, the layout, some features in the galley that you hadn't thought about, yeah. something that you could retrospectively add to your boat when you eventually buy it. So it's worth going on any boat if you get the opportunity. Get as many as you can. Get the broker that's your new friend to show you every boat that's available in the boatyard. You know, spend an afternoon with him and just go on to every single one. We did that a few times. Mm. That's locally. But there's internationally as well, isn't there? Well, I think if you are looking to buy a boat with the view of either circumnavigating or at least crossing oceans, then you're obviously the type of person that is open to new adventures and new places and new locations. So why not start your adventure in a new location, which is exactly what we did. We started in Turkey because it just so happened that's where Esper was for sale. So that's 2,000 miles away from the UK or however far away it is. Um, and we thought, well, why not? Let's just go and have a look at it. And of course, we had done our homework. So we'd done part one. We had a list of all the things that we wanted. We had also had a negative, you know, what we don't want. But we knew precisely what we wanted and we'd narrowed it right down, which is what part one's all about. So we knew that we needed to get this type of boat. And there was this one oyster, uh, Esper that was available in Turkey. So. The, the point being, though, that we were open yes. to, to buying it in Turkey. That, that was the, the point I was trying to make. Right. And that wasn't a barrier to purchase. No, not at all. Um, so if you're going to start looking further afield, why not combine looking further afield with a holiday? We went to the Caribbean and we had a good look at every place we could. I think it was Antigua, no. every single boatyard. We looked at all the boats that were in our budget. That was early on, that's before we honed it down further. So it was a lovely holiday, but also gave us the opportunity to get onto a few boats. Yeah, we actually got onto a couple of boats that were at anchor. There was one in particular, I remember, it's just, just stunningly beautiful inside. I think back then, uh, we were just blown away by how gorgeous this deep dark wood interior was. And I think now, uh, thinking back with all the experience we know, it would not have made a very good liveaboard sailboat, uh, cruising boat. Um, we were very green. I was, I was so green. I was white. I was blue. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you were green when it came to actually owning a boat. So um, 
yeah, we didn't have someone like us telling us what to do. We had to work it all out for ourselves. But yeah, it was good to get on because as much as um, you find what you want, you find what you don't want. So they're yes. really, really important. Another thing to do is to go um, on flotilla holidays. You know, you can get on a boat and have a try try the boats and see what works with you. In the group, there might be a few boats there, and usually they're based in uh, big areas where there are lots of boats many of which will be for sale. So combine a flotilla holiday with practicing and looking at other boats too. Places like Palma, Mallorca, places like that. Well, we talked in part one about uh, getting on with the people you're going to be living with and a flotilla holiday offers that. It gives you the chance for you and your family or you and your partner to spend some time together in close quarters uh, and get a feel of what it, what it will be like to do that full time. Mm. And it's an opportunity to convince your family that this is your dream, is their dream as well, if it isn't already. So choose somewhere really pretty and nice and funny. <laughs> With clement weather. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about layout in uh, part one, but we need to look specifically at layout when we're buying a boat, because this is going to impact your choice. Um, <laughs> one of the things you have to think about is the main bedroom, the main cabin. Cabin. Correct yeah. language. Cabin. Yeah. We knew pretty early on that we wanted a cabin at the back of the boat, at the stern. Uh, we wanted a nice biggish bed. We wanted plenty of room for a decent night's sleep because we knew, knew we were going to be doing this for a long time. I don't know if we knew it was going to be nearly two decades when we bought her, but we knew we needed somewhere that we were going to be able to sleep in because you've got to do that every day. Yes. Now, we should make the point that, for those who don't know, the most stable part of a boat is in the centre. Mm. So you, the saloon is the most stable part. If you think as the boat tips backwards and forwards at anchor, if you imagine the front of the boat gets the most movement. Now, this can impact a good night's sleep if you happen to be sleeping in the front of the boat. So yes. that is something you should bear in mind. And it's quite often why uh, blue water cruisers tend to have cabins at the back of the boat. Actually, not, have... not just blue water cruisers, actually. I mean, uh, we, I'm thinking of Beneteau's I've delivered, where you had living quarters both, or sleeping quarters, both at the front and the back of the boat. The back of the boat is a lot more comfortable than the front of the boat. So just bear that in mind. So you, if you want a nice big cabin at the back, you need a centre cockpit because that allows you some height and some width to put a lovely big cabin towards the back. If you've got a if you've got a cockpit at the back of the boat... Yeah, that obviously is compromising yes, on the space. It will be a lot leave. smaller. Yeah. Um, sometimes they'll put just one or maybe two small doubles at the back and quite often they'll make the main cabin at the front. Mm. We would really recommend that if you're going to be anchoring anywhere and certainly sailing very much, you don't want that. You really don't want that to be your main cabin. So that for me would be a big no-no. So anything that had a cabin only at the front was um, off our list right from the mm. outset. Quite often you'll find on blue water cruising boats, the galley appears to be quite tight, pretty small, uh, as is espers. But there's a reason for this, of course. When you are preparing food at sea, and especially in rough seas, you want to pretty much lock yourself into that space. So while a nice big galley, by the way, galley is a kitchen <laughs> where you prepare and cook your food. Um, you know, you can have a nice big space, but just think about the times when you're going to be at sea. What, how comfortable is it going to be to prepare food? Now, bear in mind, this is only sort of 1% to 10% of your time. Most of your time, no matter how much you think you're going to sell, most of your time is spent at anchor or in a marina, not sailing. So it's perhaps not so relevant for these occasions. But when you're out at sea, you do need to think about comfort when preparing food. Oh, God, and, and food becomes... The meaning of the day when you're doing long passages is massively important. So our, our galley runs down the port side of the boat. It's nice and slim so I can wedge myself, or you, because Jamie does the cooking as well, wedge ourselves there and we can do decent cooking. Um, we've, got, we've got locks on all the doors so that the boat's going sideways when, and, we've got, and we've got a gimbaled oven. We can get on and we can do things. I've seen boats where you just cannot do that at all. Stuff flies everywhere, so forget it. It doesn't have to be a long, thin galley like ours. Look on some of the older animals. They've got nice um, square galleys, but also a very small space, you'll see. You can not, usually only get one or two people in there. As you say, it's for a reason. It's really important. If it doesn't matter to you, if you're going to be just 
day hopping, but not so important. No. What else are we thinking about layout on the boat? I mean, we talked in part one about access to, to rigging and to, to lines. That's the layout on the deck and in the cockpit. So obviously you want to think about that. We're talking more about the layout of the, the living area, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and again, we, in part one, we talked about the ability to, have, to secure yourself when you're moving around the boat. Great big cavernous saloons can be difficult to get to. So if you've got to get down to the front of the boat to get out another sail or maybe to grab something in the emergency and you're in rough seas and you've got nothing to hold on to to get there, then, you know, that's going to make life a bit more difficult. Yeah, you need nice rigid furniture that is kind of part of the boat that you're going to be able to hold on to as you get along to the other side. It's true in catamarans as well. You know, they do get thrown about. They're not completely flat. So if you've got a nice big space in that catamaran, just remember in bad weather, if you're going to get across it in an ocean, you've got to have something to hold on to. You can't walk across a space with nothing to hold on to. We've got ceiling grab handle, you know, so that at least if there's nothing else, at least you can grab onto that. These are really important small things but important we also talked in part one didn't we about heads showers all that kind of thing so here on our boat in the tropics we only shower on deck we don't bother using a shower below uh, but we do have one we have it it's it's in the single heads that we have because there's just two of us we only need one head you would have done your homework before you start looking you'll have decided if you need one or two hmm. i'm just thinking also layout can also apply to on the deck so walking around right. the deck and I, I was just thinking because obviously you're going to be getting on and off the boat either in a marina but perhaps more importantly via your dinghy so you may want to think about how easy it is for you and your partner your crew or your family to get on and off the dinghy yeah. bearing in mind of course sometimes you can be doing this in uh, choppy waters as well so you need somewhere safe and secure to land yourself and the dinghy onto the boat and get onto it. Mm. Uh, we're fortunate we put in a very sturdy swim platform at the back of the boat which makes getting on and off the boat very easy. Mm. Uh, quite often you'll get on and off the boats on the side uh, using a removable ladder which can be a little bit more tricky mm. but uh, just have a think about that. But we use our side access as well when we're at anchor sometimes uh, mm. with the weather and the waves it's actually easier to get on certainly to deliver stuff to our jerry, boat jerry cans yeah and, uh, on the side yes yes yeah, and also just remember you may be med mooring wherever your cruising ground is if you've decided you've got a, a smaller cruising ground or you're in an area where you need to med moor that's like the mediterranean you've you probably going to want to get on and off at the side aren't you you're going to want to have your dinghy out the back there yeah. I don't know. it's not so easy so we should explain when you met more there's yeah. going to be a gap between the back of the boat and the jetty that you've uh, run a line to um, or the so, shore just a boulder <laughs> so unless you have a passerelle which is a long ladder or a plank which allows you that access then you won't be able to get on and off at the back but yeah. uh, yes so you could be getting on and off at the side yeah so just remember where you're going to be going back to part one but anyway um, I, I think the point is is that when you get on these boats you'll you'll get a feel for it as you move around the boat and uh, you'll get a feel for whether it's comfortable for, for you and your family did you know that liking and subscribing on youtube or wherever you get your podcasts helps us to get noticed go on give us a helping hand so we've got a checklist of things for you to look at if you get the opportunity. Obviously, these will all be covered off by the surveyor, but you should be looking at these things as well. So you've got a little bit further down the track, you've found a few boats that you think you really like. Now start looking in a bit more detail before you start paying someone else to do it. Um, you're going to start with rigging, aren't you? Yeah, I, th I guess the most obvious thing, because we're talking about sailboats here, um, is to, when you get on the boat, is grab the rigging, mm. a little trick. You should do this with a gloved hand, but you can do it bare hand. Is run your hand down the rigging to see if there are any nicks in the cables, uh, because obviously sometimes you can't actually see mm. those defects. Mm. Uh, look at the chain plates, uh, which are the base at which the rigging is secured to that goes through the decks. Is there any signs of rust? Perhaps more importantly, cracks around the deck where these mm. chain plates go into. Um, now again. All of these little tips we're going to give you are covered off in the surveyor's report and he will be doing this as well. But it just 
good for you to be primed with a few of these. It's a good, it's, and it's so easy. You just do this as you go around the boat. Nobody needs to know what you're doing. You're having a good old thing. It's giving you your first impression. Yeah. Look at the turnbuckles, the connections between the chain plates and the cables. Yeah. Uh, again, evidence of cracks. Are there missing split pins? This could be a sign of mismanagement by the owner who's not looking after his rigging properly. We've got a few more of those as well. I think that's an important thing is to get a sense of how well the boat has been looked after yes. by the current owner. And there's a few little tips that we're going to give you on that. Yes. Um, and then, of course, with the rigging, I guess you want to find the age as well. Now, you may have heard that a lot of insurance companies insist on changing your rigging once every 10 years, uh, which is pretty unreasonable. I was thinking suspension bridges don't change their cables every 10 years, do they? <laughs> Perhaps they have bigger cables than we do. They just maintain better. Yeah. Um, but the fact is, is that good rigging will last far longer, but it may be the insurance company uh, is insisting that you need to change every 10 years. Or if you find a sympathetic insurance company, they will make do with a rigging report. But you should at least find out the, the age of the rigging and who fitted it. Yeah, this is something the broker should, should have at their fingertips immediately, how old it is, which will give you an idea if you've got to take some money off to do the rigging. Yeah. Uh, because you may have to re-rig it yourself or get it re-rigged for you. And just an, on a note, just because you've got to do work on the boat isn't a reason for not buying it. The important thing is to know what you've got to do because then you can work out your budget, you know. Okay, if I've got to add rigging and it's going to cost 2000 or 10000 however much it's going to cost, do I knock that off the price? Has the seller already knocked that off because they know you're going to have to do that? So this is, and this is applicable to everything. So really important, don't worry if there's anything wrong with it. Hopefully the seller and the broker will be very upfront about it. Just negotiate that into the price because everything is repairable and replaceable on a boat. Yep, yep. Unless it's been a write-off, and yes. it's and it's uh, it's been you know its structure has been impaired somehow. So I guess the next thing, if you're looking at a sailboat, is to look at the sails themselves. <laughs> uh, now. You don't necessarily want to be unfurling them on your first visit, but just to have a quick look to see if you get a sense that they're still white and not green. Uh, there's no fraying bits or the stitching hasn't come away. And, uh, you know, just check the running rigging as well. These are all the lines that connect to the sails. So your furling lines, that kind of thing. Just a quick visual inspection. Make sure they're not chafed. Green. Green, yes. Trailing on the deck. Yeah. Nicely uh, coiled and put away. Yeah. And, and perhaps get a sense of how much it would cost to replace the sails. Mm. So uh, the broker may have an idea of this, but certainly the owner will have a good idea of mm. how much it would cost to, to put a new set of sails on. So again, age, they hopefully will be able to tell you how, yeah. how long they've been on there. And, and again, age is a difficult one. Um, one thing that you, if you can get the sails out, uh, one thing to, is to look for sag or how baggy a sail is. Um, I know our stay sail when we bought Esper was shaped like a spoon, wasn't it? <laughs> it? It had so much sag in it, we knew we had to replace it. To be honest, we didn't replace it for many years and it, it was fine. It worked but, pretty um, well. Yeah. But, but yeah, just a quick visual inspection of yourselves. Of yeah, course. so things that you might find wrong in your visual inspection, hopefully the surveyor may say, actually, it's not that bad, it's got another five years in it. So coming on to that later. But yeah, so um, is it in mast or slab? I've written down as a little... <laughs> I think that just comes down to personal preference. Yeah. We're, we've told this story before, but we didn't really want in-mast furling and we have a boat with two in-mast <laughs> furling mechanisms and it has been amazing. It's been wonderful. Uh, it's been so easy to manage, especially in heavy weather. So that's just an example of where we thought we didn't want something, yes. but actually it turned out that it was OK. Compromise is king. There, there you go. go. Yep. Um, OK, the next one, is there anything else on sales? I don't think that I've got anything else. Uh, so I guess the next thing is to look at the engine. Yeah. Um, now, on your first visit, you may be lucky to uh, uh, just at least view it. Yeah. And in that moment, just have a look at the fittings, make sure there's no corrosion. Um, if, if you get the opportunity, a good, a good little trick is to check the oil level, not just of the engine, though, but mm -hmm. of the gearbox. Uh, because everyone remembers to change the oil in the engine or top it up, but the gearbox sometimes 
gets uh, left behind. Right. So uh, this might not be necessary. Or it might not be possible on your first visit. But... Yeah, you've got, yeah, just talking about that, you've got to be a little bit careful. If the owner is there, they may not want you prodding around. Mm. I always try to go on a boat without the owner being there. Much better just to do it with the broker because you can be quite honest with each other there. Yeah, you've got to remember that the people selling their boats, they're selling their baby. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're attached to their baby. So, yes, you do have to be sensitive to that if the owner is there. So what I'm advising you here in terms of checking the oil and things, you might want to check with the owner first if he's on board. But mm. uh, it, it's just a good example of uh, finding out how well looked after the boat is by the owner, checking things like the uh, the oil levels. But more importantly, with the engine, uh, see if you can find out how many uh, miles it's done. Yeah. A diesel engine will do many, many, many thousands of miles if it's been well serviced and well maintained though. They'll last for decades. They should do. Yes. Even though we're in a marine environment, you know, you, you can look after a, a, an engine on a boat well. You can also abuse it and uh, not service it at all. And I think that will be quite evident when you look at uh, things like, uh, you know, connections around the water hoses, yes. for example, whether you see corrosion or not. The, uh, the engine mounts, have a look at the engine mounts, see if there's any corrosion mm. there. I would also be slightly wary, I think, if I saw an engine that was absolutely pristine. Do you think it might have been clean to do within an inch of its life and not be telling us the truth? Ah, difficult, <laughs> difficult to say. Yeah. An engine should be absolutely pristine, right, shouldn't okay. it? You should really have <laughs> it lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, what about common rail and traditional? Do you need to have that on your checklist? Yes. Now, for those who don't know, common rail diesel engines are uh, have a lot more electronics going on in them. Quite often you'll find that charter companies run common rail engines they're more much more efficient uh, the problem though is that when they break down you need a laptop and an IT expert to uh, diagnose what the problem is with the engine they're not as simple as a straightforward naturally aspirated uh, diesel engine so if it has a common rail diesel engine I would avoid it at all costs certainly if you're going to do blue water and remote anchoring we've we've had problems with the engine and um we've had new starter motors just sent over and just bolted on you know and very easy because our engine is isn't common rail we've got a basic beater and before that we had a perkins like tractor engines mm. which is pretty much what all the fishing boats have so if they're if you're anywhere near a fishing boat there's usually someone who can help you uh common rail forget it you need sort of circuit boards and things which fishing boats do not have yeah. so yeah i mean definitely we wouldn't advise going for one. But the other thing to think about, of course, nowadays is electric and hybrid engines. Yeah, it's not an area that I have too much expertise on or knowledge on at all, to be honest. From what I understand, though, is that we're still not quite there yet when it comes to offshore propulsion, liverboard cruising. When you're living on the boat and you're using all that power to live, so it could be your cooking, running laptops, electronic gear, uh, and then also running uh, the motor. You know, I, I don't know. I don't think we're quite there yet when it comes to hybrid engines. But, I think it will be amazing when we are. Yeah. That's something I would love to do in the future. But I, to be honest, when you're looking to buy a boat, and I imagine a lot of you will be looking at second-hand boats as well, I suspect 99.9% .9 of them will be diesel mm. engines anyway. Uh, just the other thing to think about is the age of the engine. You may find that it's a certain make or model which is difficult to get parts for. I do know some people with particular types of engines uh, have real problems trying to source mm. spare parts for them. So uh, just do your research, do your homework on that. Mm. Uh, there are engine surveys. Some people have an engine survey. They might have a recent one that they're prepared to share with you, just like some people have rigging surveys. We have one for Esper and the vendor, if they have one, should be happy to show it to you, I would have thought, as well as you yeah. know, a previous survey, if it's not that old. Absolutely. All of that could be really useful. Um, so engines, next one, another E, electronics. Yeah. Yeah, again, I mean, if you can get a chance to flick a few switches and check things, uh, have a look at the battery terminals on the batteries just to see if they're clean and not corroded. Again, this is just a little way of working out how well the boat has been looked after mm. by, the, by the current owner. 
Um, check things like circuit breakers. When you turn the light circuit breaker on, um, can you then switch the lights on? Mm. Or just, or just the shower come on? <laughs> exactly, yeah. You need to check for, uh, for, for things like that if you can. Again, just be sensitive to podding and prodding and proking around the prodding and proking, prodding and proking around the boat if the owner is there. So um, you might want to check things like uh, the windlass. You know, does the does the windlass work? Do the up and down buttons on the windlass operate as you would expect? Um, solar panels, wind generators, are they putting in power? See if you can get to find the solar panel, uh, the regulator. Or the MPPT controller, can you see a charge yeah. coming in? Does the boat have them? Because you may be wanting to have a lot of solar power, you, you may be wanting all kinds of ways to generate power on your boat. Um, does the existing one on the boat set up work for you? Or do you think you might need to put replace them completely or put a whole you know, more of sol solar panels in? All this is going to affect your price. And if you're buying in somewhere very remote, even more because they've got to get them in there somehow. Mm. Uh, check your bilge pumps, of course, make sure that they are working. VHF, is that working as well if it comes with one, which it, of course it should do. And in fact, a lot of things on the boat, if it's advertised in the uh, in the list price, uh, you, you should expect them to be working. So there's no point in advertising a radar if it doesn't work, mm. because that is something that you could potentially knock off the asking price for yeah. to replace. If he's listed it of course you might find he didn't tell you about the uh the installed generator because it's not working and you end up getting a free generator out of it that costs 100 quid to fix so yes you know swings and roundabouts as we said everything's fixable yes um the other major thing with uh, a boat of course is its navigation equipment and again that's something that if you get a chance to make sure it's all working is there depth if the boat's in the water you should have depth do you get wind? Do the charts load up OK? Uh, you know, just make sure that all the buttons on the chart plot are, are, are working as you would expect. Mm. If you get us, if you're lucky enough to get a test sail, of course, you'll be able to do all of this. We're out sailing the boat, but we'll come on to test sails later. So that's an interesting thing about electronics and electrics. It's usually nine times out of ten. Some the problems on boats are because of cables, aren't they? Yeah, cables do go, they don't last forever. We tend to all go at the same time because they're usually all installed at the same time. So yeah, difficult to check. Yeah, a lot of these are difficult to check, but uh, you know, there are a few sort of visual giveaway signs as you just uh, have a cursory look around the boat. Just, you yeah. know, keep, don't, I think that the important thing is, is not to be wowed by say its layout. You know, you found a boat with the aft cabin you've been looking for in this lovely saloon. Uh, but you need to look through that and look at uh, all the things that uh, are supposed to move and turn on and off. And you need to make sure that they do move or don't move and turn on and off. Yes, and so you can calculate how much work you'll have to do when you've bought the boat. Um, the hull. Yes, now this is going to be difficult to check when the boat's in the water. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to buying boats in the water versus up on the hard. But if the boat happens to be up on the hard, it gives you a chance to check the hull. Of course, eventually, if you put an offer in on the boat and you get a surveyor's report, he's going to want to check the hull anyway. So that is something that you'll need to negotiate with the buyer, taking the boat out the water and mm. putting it on the hard for your survey. Um, but if it happens to be out the water, I think the most important thing is to look to see if it's had a great big accident. Yeah, see if they've tried to cover up an accident. And it can be done. You can tap the hole, can't you? You can, you can see outlines of patches and things like that. That's something the surveyors should be looking for. Yes. Um, if they've had an accident, they should tell you. And Absolutely. then you can make the decision about whether you still want to buy it or not, depending because, on what happened. By the way, you know, accidents, again, they can be patched up, but it may be that the accident actually had an impact on something structural that was that you can't repair. Mm -hmm. So just, just be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, grab the rudder, give it a good shake, make sure it's nice and tight. Mm -hmm. When you're in the cockpit on the steering wheel, give that a good turn, make sure that that feels nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. uh, the shaft and the, uh, the rudder, uh, sorry, the prop, give them a good shake as well, make sure they're nice and tight. Look at your through hull fittings as well. Make sure there's no corrosion there or signs of leaking around the skin fitting. Um, again, these are just you know little things that you can check while you look around the boat that yes. uh, shouldn't stand out as being a problem. 
have a good look at the deck. Um, we, we talked in part one about wooden decks or not. Um, wooden decks can last, they don't last forever. Um, so have a really good look at that wooden deck and you may have to replace it, which is a massively expensive thing to do. So uh, that needs to be thoroughly checked. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing on a deck is that you don't, you haven't got water ingress mm. and this is relevant to whether it's a teak deck or a glass fibre deck or Steel. cork, whatever you have, you need to make sure that the deck is solid and true. Mm. Uh, if you get water ingress and you get water into the core of the deck, quite often it will feel spongy. I mean, we've heard examples of where uh, around the masts, it's literally sunk. Mm. Um, but again, A, the surveyor will pick up on this and B, the owner should tell you about these problems. Should well. tell you about all any problems, of course. It doesn't always happen, but mostly it does, but sometimes it doesn't. But walking around the deck is something you can do. You can walk all over that deck and you can feel with your feet if there's something wrong. and. Uh, that goes down in a little notebook as to whether it's going to affect whether you buy it and your offer and also what you want to tell the surveyor because you want to give the surveyor as much information as you can that you've already gleaned yourself. Okay, so you've checked the boat out and you're impressed, you love it. So what do you do? If you find this topic interesting and would like to continue the conversation, come and join the Follow the Boat Discord community. Look for the link in the description. It's free. You found the boat of your dreams. You want to buy it. What do you do next? You make an offer. So this is the point at which it all starts to get very exciting. You're already excited, but even more excited because you want to buy this boat. But we have a word on prices before you do that. Yes, I came up with my th three... I don't know, I haven't, made a, I haven't ha had a title for it yet, but my idea is that there are three possible ways that the boat is going to be priced. Mm. And the first one will be an absolute bargain. Oh, lovely, we all love a bargain. We all love a bargain, yes. Uh, but of course, as we know, sometimes things can be too good to be true. And I think we're all aware of this. This doesn't just apply to boats, but if something seems to be extremely cheap, there could be a very serious reason why. Mm. It could be that the boat has a, a major problem that you haven't been told about. Uh, that could be a structural issue, it may, have, it may be a write-off. Mm. It could even be an ownership issue. Mm. It could have been stolen. Perhaps the boat's been stolen, who knows? Uh, but I would definitely treat a boat that is 50 grand less than it should be with a great deal of caution. Yeah, there's a reason for it. You don't know what it is necessarily, unless they've been very upfront. There's some big problem there. Uh, and I would also be worried about the owners that don't reply to all the things you ask, you know. They don't know the answers to things. So that's dodgy as well. If it's a low price and you've got a dodgy owner not answering, then uh, leave that one alone. However, having said that, we do know of bargains. We personally know of bargains that have been yeah. sold for it, various reasons. It does happen. It mm. does happen. Um, so... Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, no, I want to say on that note, <laughs> before you gallop ahead, yes. that there are bargains to be had. We know, we know people who've sold quickly because they just want to sell it. They don't care about the money. Um, and you'll know about it only because you've got that good relationship with the broker that we talked about earlier, because the broker doesn't need to put it on the market. He's already got a set of people that he's looking for boats for. If you're one of them and he likes you and it ticks all the boxes, he'll ring you first. That's when you get the bargain. And that's how I know other people have got bargains. Mm. It's also actually how I got my house. There we go. So, I said it didn't just apply to boats. No. But my second way that this could be priced is the seller's price. Uh, we see this all the time. <laughs> this is where the boat uh, is maybe perhaps a little bit more expensive than what it is worth because the vendor has just spent 20 grand replacing something or getting some work done to the boat in order to sell it. And this is a little bit unfair because that 20 grand that he's just spent he should have actually spent over the last five years just maintaining the boat to a certain standard. So he's spent the 20 or she spent the 20 grand to get it up to spec anyway, to get it to the price that it should be. And expects and that 20 grand back. On top. They exactly. Put, yes, okay. We've seen this all the time. Yeah. We see boats for sale that just don't move because the vendor, the seller, 
wants to sell it for what he thinks it's worth or she even thinks it's worth not what it's really worth to the buyer or to the market yeah so yes it's often people who need to liquidate and need to make a certain amount of money to do something and they stick to that and they just don't sell it mm. so that's crazy if you're selling a boat don't do that it's pointless yep okay and then finally Oh, you're saying there's one more point I've missed? Yeah, on the, on that. So if you do come across a boat like that, which is inexplicably more expensive than the others, and, and uh, they're un, 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 unable to explain why, that's when you put in a silly offer, isn't it? Yeah, it's also worth bearing in mind that some people don't really want to sell their boat. <laughs> <laughs> they begrudgingly put it on the market, and they could actually probably be quite happy to continue to buy, uh, to live on their boat for the next five years, yes. uh, but sell it for the price that they want to. So, yes, that's a good point. You may come across a tricky vendor that doesn't, you know, he's not interested in negotiating. Yes. Um, so, yeah, pros and cons to that that kind of vendor actually. Mm. Uh, but the third one, of course, is the boat is priced to sell. Mm. And this is the realistic one. This is the one that you really want to be buying into. What's funny is you actually see that written on adverts sometimes. Priced to sell. Do you mean all the others aren't priced to sell? <laughs> well, but as, we've, as I've just explained, yeah. sometimes they aren't priced to sell. But the vendor here is being realistic. They've already knocked off some money off the asking price because they know that some work needs to be doing uh, done to it. Maybe they have spent 20 grand doing the boat up, but they've actually only added 10 grand onto the asking price. Uh, you know, so it, I think the price to sell category is what you want to be looking for and is the realistic one. It's going to be the closest to what the average market value is for that, um, that particular make or model. Bear in mind, of course, that average market prices can still vary because you can have two identical boats, uh, but with very different systems on board and kitted out very differently. One could be extremely comprehensive uh, with a water maker and lithium batteries and ready to sail around yes. the ocean. The other one might need a lot of work. So this is why you do get big variations in the price of the same make and model boat. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are the three. Yep. Whatever the three, you've thought it through. First thing you do is you make an offer. So you ring the broker, you tell them what your offer is. They'll give you an immediate reaction. They'll laugh in your face or they'll say, OK, I'll put it to the buyer. They are supposed to put it to the buyer. Uh, and then you take it from there. Once you get to the stage where you have agreed a price, you and the buyer, once you've agreed that price, you then get a survey. And for us, there's no question about whether you get a survey or not you get a survey. Unless you're a professional surveyor yourself or a boat builder or something, get the professionals in to look at the boat because uh, boats are full of all kinds of hidden secrets that only a surveyor will find. But also don't insurance companies ask for surveyors report as well? Yes, well, yes, maybe not on an, a newer boat. Um, not always. They don't always need a surveyor's report, but I would have thought that, yes, actually, you should be in touch with your insurance company at that stage because you need to find out if they will insure this boat for you in the cruising ground that you're interested in. So don't forget to do that. Don't get all the way down to the end and buy the boat and just discover you can't insure it. But so, a, yeah. a, a surveyor is your friend. And uh, they, don't forget, these surveyors have seen so many boats. Uh, they're almost always going to know more than you will ever know about uh, how a boat is constructed and more, most importantly to look out for all the telltale signs of things that are wrong with it. Now some surveyors may allow you to shadow them when they're doing the survey and in fact uh, I think it was John Champion uh, when we yeah. last did our survey um, he very kindly allowed me to stand actually video what he was doing and he would turn to camera and explain what he was doing and that was very useful because then you're actually able to ask questions about what he's surveying while it's actually happening. It so. gives you a lot of confidence in that surveyor as well. They've got yeah. nothing to hide. They're doing a really thorough job. Because um, there's a lot of cowboys out yes, there. So you yes. should get a recommendation 
or new surveyor? Not from the owner or the broker yes. either. You need to get the recommendation from other sailors. Not always easy, so you have to really shop around. Just remember when it comes to the survey that you can get additional surveys as well. So you can get a rigging survey, you can get an engine survey. So if either of those things are particularly uh, worrisome, you may want to add those in. You can talk to the surveyor about everything that you want to do. Um, you don't want a survey just for what, whether, what it's worth. You need a thorough mechanical yep. um, system survey. Yeah, it will cost you money, but uh, in, in the long run, it's important. So when you agree the price with the buyer, you have to say subject to survey because you never know, something may come out of the survey that you can use to negotiate that price with. You don't want to be stuck with the price that you agreed. They have to be aware the survey may well throw something up. If it's something that the buyer has already told you, the vendor has already told you about, that you already know about, and, and they'll come back and they say, well, that's why it's priced that way, fair enough. But a surveyor may produce some completely rabbit out of the hat that you weren't expecting that would allow you to negotiate further. Yep. The other thing that um, we, we haven't discussed, in fact, um, it's not really part of the survey, but when you come to negotiate prices, that you need to look at what's actually included um, because generally, everything you see on the boat is supposed to be included, isn't it? Yeah. But they may take certain things off. So uh, if the dinghy is hanging off the back with a 15 horsepower engine attached to the dinghy, I think you more than likely can expect that dinghy to be included in the yeah, price. should do, yeah. And if you're not sure, just double check with them. Well, I know of a boat that got sold that didn't even have an anchor or chain on oh. the boat. And I know why. Because it was, it was sold through a third party. Right. I'm not mentioning any names, okay. but that third party helped themselves to all the kit on the boat, took it off, and there was no definitive list from the vendor right. for the buyer to check. Right. So they, the buyer then ended up, after buying the boat, then ended up having to spend a lot of money replacing all the gear that should have come as standard. Yeah, so just double check that everything that you think you're buying, you are getting. I mean, things like portable generators, beach chairs and tables, paddle boards, kayaks, bicycles, maybe a cat or a dog. All these things are on the boat, but do they come with it? Just I'd get that in writing. Yeah. If they've got a cat, I'd suggest you get it because they're really good at keeping the rats off. <laughs> So if you've done the you've had the survey done, it's thrown up something, you've renegotiated the price, everybody's happy. Now is the tart chance, possibly, or before I say that, the survey you do need, as you already said, an in-water and out-of-water survey. And there may be some <laughs> negotiating on who pays for that and whether, you, you know, whether you're well, paying to splash it. Or just to, to be clear, yeah. you're paying for the surveyor. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and... Almost, yeah. almost invariably, you will also be paying for the boat to be dropped in the water if yeah. it's on the hard. Yeah. Or, now, that's up to you to then, maybe you can negotiate that with the vendor against the asking price. Maybe the vendor says, nope, anyone that comes to see the boat has to pay for the drop-in and that's outside the asking yes. price. Or the haul out. Yeah, right. but speak to the broker about that. Yes. So it can add up to quite a bit of money. So you need to work out the best way to do that. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon, or join us on FTB Mates, or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. Test sale, you might get a chance to do the test sale before the survey, if you can grab it. If the boat's in the water, in a marina, you can get half an hour going out in the boat and just practicing and a few things and seeing all the systems, electronics and whatnot. Great, do it. Can I just hold yes. on here? Yes, You're yes. rushing ahead saying test sale. Yes. That's you, The purchase of the boat is not always dependent on a test sale. We didn't do a test sale when we bought Esper. No, we didn't. We didn't have the opportunity to, but you don't have to. I'm just saying that if you can, it's great. It, absolutely, but don't be surprised if you don't get to do a test sale is all I'm saying, because it may be that only the current, uh, the vendor is the only person insured to be on that boat and to take it out in the water. The broker will almost certainly not be the person responsible for taking it for a test sale. Yeah. So, yeah, think, and the owner may not be there, so you can't uh, do but it. But the, the owner may not be there as, yeah. as well. So I think, we need to be clear that a test sale is not necessarily uh, an expectation before buying a boat. 
But if you get the chance to... Really do it. Great opportunity. It's, it's really do. I just want to go back to survey. We do know of, of boats that haven't had surveys. There's one on YouTube I've been watching recently. Two years after buying it, they are still dealing with all the defects and haven't actually been anywhere yet. Mm. Oh, we know a lot of people like that. <laughs> yes, we do. Dealing with defects, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so that that's it then. So you, maybe you've been lucky enough to have the test sale, you've had the survey, you've renegotiated the price, you're now ready to buy. You've looked at insurance. Your insurance companies say, we, we need the survey, you've done that anyway. And uh, they've said, okay, we're happy to insure you. You've now got yourself a boat. Woohoo! <laughs> hey. <laughs> Some people say to me, how do you, but how do you know? How do you know it's the right boat? You can get buying fever where you never stop looking. You keep looking, you keep looking, you keep looking for the next one. The next one might be better. Two problems there. Firstly, you haven't been compromising, have you? You've got to remember, you've got to see beyond the things, oh, yes. that, the things that don't tick every box. Yep. Secondly, you know when you love a boat, don't you? Yes, you'll walk onto it and uh, you'll feel it in your heart. You will. Something will chime. Something will just click into place. The boat will sing to you. Yeah. It really will. Yeah. It's exactly what Esper did, and I still sing to her. Uh, so, good luck. Well, can I, sorry. Oh, we haven't uh, finished. No, I was just going... I've just had a thought, actually. Oh. It's not an unknown, but I did just have a thought. I think a lot of people may be watching this video thinking, well, how much does it cost? Oh, right, what, right, right. What, yes. what should I be spending? And we get asked this question so frequently about what it costs to be a liverboard, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day living, that kind of thing. And we always come back with the same answer. It depends on your budget. Yes. You need to budget for your purchase. We can't tell you that you need to spend $150,000 on yes. a boat and it's pointless if your budget is only a hundred thousand. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so sorry we didn't mention this earlier about budgeting, but it is. It's, it is. Although it's going to depend on. It's going to influence very much what you look at. As Jamie says, it's a it's a difficult number, and only you know that number. We worked up our budget on what we had. We said we've got this amount of money. This is all we've got. This is what we this is what we're going to spend on a boat. And what boats can we get for that? So you know that and that could be anything. It could be 20 grand, it could be a million. Don't know. But all of the things we've just talked about all apply. It could be second hand, could be new, whatever. Apply to whatever the price is. So the old adage though, remember this. Standing under a cold shower tearing up $100 bills is like owning a boat. What is it? Boats B O A T. I can't break, break out another thousand. Break out another thousand. It is true. Boats cost a lot more than you think. So the other thing we do suggest is that you keep some money back. Yeah, this is especially true when you're buying second-hand yeah. boats. Perhaps less so relevant when you're buying a new boat, where you have the opportunity to kit the boat out exactly to your specification. But when you buy a second-hand boat, there will be things that you will need to repair, to replace, to modify as you spend time on the boat and familiarise yourself with it. There may be things that you completely forgot about when buying the boat, mm. a system that you hadn't even thought about that suddenly becomes relevant after two months of being on the boat. So yes, keep aside it's 20, a, 20 to 25% of your complete budget, your total budget for these eventualities. And we're not talking about the things that have come up in the survey. No. No, we're talking about above and beyond that. Yes. Phew. Well, that's uh, that's been a, a long one. There's so much information there. Now, we should say, of course, as usual, if you're on YouTube, watching this on YouTube, we will answer comments. Uh, but if you want a more in-depth discussion, then please do go over to Discord. And if you have found this information valuable, then please do consider joining us on FTB Mates. Both part one and part two are available online, all written out beautifully by me with all the headings and the subheadings and all the information that we've given you over two hours, available to our FTB mates on the FTB website. There we go. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Happy shopping. Peace and fair winds. <laughs>